Okay, so for some reason, when I hear the word Atkins, I instantly think of the very beautiful Jennifer Aniston and celebrity culture in the early noughties in general. Atkins had its heyday for sure, but a new diet culture is in town and its name is the ketogenic diet or the cuter keto diet. When I was researching for my last video explaining the keto diet in 30 seconds, I kept thinking to myself, wait, isn't this just Atkins but repackaged? It's basically Atkins 2.0, right? Well, kind of. Both diets are meant to induce ketosis, which is where there's a low availability of glucose in the body, so it makes up for this by producing ketones in the liver and using those for energy. And this is brought about by avoiding carbs, which is the whole mainstay of both diets. But to compare the two properly, we have to look at them both individually. So let's start with Old Man Atkins. They have their own website with um, guidance on how to follow the Atkins diet recipes, you can buy protein bars and shakes. They really have marketed the duck soup out of this diet. And, oh my God, talking about health marketing. Did you know that in the 1900s, the word goop was literally slang for a stupid person? I mean, was that on purpose? Anyways, that is a whole nother video. So let's not digress right now. But there are four phases of Atkins with phase one also being called induction. They say that you limit the amount of carbs you eat to around 20 grams a day in phase one, causing your body to switch its main fuel source from carbs to fat. They've also written that phase one isn't for everyone. If you don't have that much weight to lose, or if you are a vegetarian, you'll start in phase two instead. Just for reference to 20 grams of carbs is nothing. Um, there's about 27 grams of carbs in a standard issue banana. So um, and then there's phase two, you are supposed to increase your carb intake little by little to find your carb tolerance. And then during phase three, you increase your carb intake by 10 grams per week. This is so you can find your carb balance. It says um, if your weight loss stalls, drop your carb intake by 10 grams for a week and then introduce an extra five grams until you find your level. So now we've got the terms carb tolerance and carb balance. I I couldn't find anything rooted in any scientific literature that explains these two terms. God only knows why. But from the non-legit looking websites I found, it's basically how you feel after eating different amounts of carbs, like if you are still hungry or not. You're supposed to eat the same fat and protein source alongside a certain amount of carbs and then only change the amount of carbs the next day with the same meal. But I don't really see how that helps as what you eat early in the day could have an effect on your appetite. Like I once had a mushroom soup for lunch that made me pretty much not eat until the next day. It was some soup and mushrooms are extremely low in carbs, but there probably was a lot of butter in there. And as we all know, butter is a carb. And then phase four um, is literally just maintaining the established level of carbs you're eating. So Atkins is based on eating a set number of carbs without thinking much about the other macros, meaning fat and protein. And then in the keto diet, again, we are getting the liver to make ketone bodies. The keto diet is a bit more intense as it requires that you pretty much deprive yourself of carbohydrates completely. Um, it's well fewer um, than 20 to 50 grams of carbs per day, which is like a maximum of two standard issue bananas. And because the keto diet has such a high fat requirement, followers of the diet must eat fat at each meal. Um, so in a standard 2000 calorie diet, that might look like 165 grams of fat, 40 grams of carbs, and 75 grams of protein. Not only are you supposed to get your fat content from the so-called healthy um, unsaturated fat, so from things like nuts, avocados, tofu, olive oil, um, but they also encourage you to eat a big chunk of saturated fats, which just sounds quite funny. Um, fruit isn't really encouraged as all fruits are rich in carbs, but you can have certain fruits like berries in small portions. Um, vegetables, which are also packed with carbs, are normally restricted to leafy greens such as kale and spinach. So at this point, it will probably be unsurprising that the keto diet is associated with an increase in LDL cholesterol, so the bad cholesterol, which is of course linked to heart disease. Also, because you're restricting what you eat, you can become nutrient deficient, especially with micronutrients, including selenium, magnesium, phosphorus, vitamins B and C. Also, you'll know if you saw my last video that I can bung you up good and proper as the diet is low in fibrous foods as fiber is found in whole grain versions of starchy carbs. So we've got Atkins and we've got the keto diet. On one hand, we've got tracked carbs and the option to eat a varied diet alongside that. Whereas on the other hand, we've got practically no carbs and a pretty restricted diet. 
The keto diet is like a constant phase one Atkins, which if you recall, Atkins have said it ain't for everyone. So basically the popular low carb diets like Atkins and also paleo modify a true keto diet. The problem is, is that people hear anecdotally that these diets work. Theories about short-term low-carb diet success include lower appetite because fat burns slower than carbs. But we don't know about the long-term and eating a restrictive diet, no matter what the plan is, super hard to sustain. And once you resume a normal diet, because at some point you will, and the weight you lost through that short-term plan will probably return. So basically, I'm saying that you should try and eat healthily, don't eat too much sugar or saturated fats, treat yourself every now and again and exercise if you're trying to lose weight and drink lots of water. Oh, and other side effects of low carb diets are things like headaches, dizziness and irritability. So yet another reason not to do it, especially if you want to be able to keep your brain in tip top shape. Um, something else you can do to keep your brain in shape is solving puzzles. Um, doing puzzles helps reinforce existing connections between our brain cells. It also increases the generation of new relationships. This in turn improves mental speed and thought processes. Puzzles can play an important role in maintaining overall brain health and brain games may help sharpen certain thinking skills that tend to wane with age, such as processing speed, planning skills, reaction time, decision-making and short-term memory, according to a study in the November 2016 International Psychogeatrics. That being said, we are super lucky that Brilliant are sponsoring this video as they have a 100 day challenge that lets you solve new challenges every day. They are varied and can help you apply things like physics principles to puzzles, but help you break it down so even someone who ain't a big physics nerd like me can do it. So if you want to keep your brain on its toes, go to brilliant.org for slash science with Katie where you can sign up for free. You can find the link in the description down below in the doobly doo. And the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription too. So go check it out. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, hit subscribe. A big thank you to my patrons on Patreon and thank you for watching. Bye.